my st the starting point for this discussion needs to be a very simple fact, which is that the global renewable energy revolution is already underway. This is reflected in the fact that total investment in renewables at the moment is on an annual basis running at double total investments in fossil fuels and nuclear energy combined. I'll say more about these details. I was asked to uh, ad address the question of a just transition. A just transition implies a transition to what the preamble of the SDGs refers to as a transformed world. That's the exact words that are used, not often referred to. And essentially, in my view, implies the achievement of SDG number one, the eradication of poverty, without blowing the fuses of the planet. That's the challenge of our generation. If we achieve that, we will have achieved a just transition. There is, however, a very distinct danger that we could be making an, an unjust transition. An unjust transition is a transition to a decarbonized world which leaves inequality and poverty intact, more or less intact. That would be an unfortunate outcome and a missed opportunity because the renewable energy revolution contains within it the potential for giving a certain directionality to the transition to the transformed world envisaged in the preamble of the SDGs. And what I'm essentially saying is that the wider sustainability transition, the wider just transition, will, will depend very much on the directionality of the renewable energy revolution. And despite the fact that that direction at the moment, as you will see, I think is uh, not in the appropriate direction, there are ways of thinking about how it could be steered into what one could call energy democratization or energy democracy. A, a transition normally happens when three shifts take place simultaneously when there's a new energy system, a new mobility system, and a new communication system. When these three interact, you get major industrial transformations. Think of steam engines and printing. Think of combustion engines and long distance telephony and AC electricity. Think of now the renewable, decentralized renewable energy interfacing with the internet uh, and new mass transit systems. Just coming back to my, 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 my opening assertion about the nature of the renewable energy revolution underway. In 2016, renewables provided 20% 20 of total uh, generated energy. In 2017, renewables grew 9% year on year. The renewables provided 70% of all new net energy globally uh, in 2017. Solar is now the fastest growing of the renewable energy sectors. And as I've uh, already hinted, renewables, the total installed capacity in renewables is double that of fossil fuels and nuclear combined. Total investment in 2017 was uh, 280 billion, now, pro now just going over uh, 300 billion. There are 179 countries around the world with renewable energy targets, and 57 of those have committed to being 100% renewable. And renewable energy now is cheaper uh, in, than fossil fuels in nearly 100 countries, including our own. So China is obviously a very big player. China is at, a, is at about $165 billion of, of, of investment in renewables growing from a mere 2 billion in 2002 to 100 billion in 2014 to 165 billion in 2017. China has a small R&D budget though, which means they are producing renewables on license, mainly from German companies and elsewhere, and I'll come back to that issue. Compare China's investment to the big US investment, which came out of Silicon Valley, roughly 25 billion, most of them failures, 
Tesla being a key exception. Bloomberg estimates that uh, between 2014 and 2030, we're looking at a total investment in renewables of about 5.1 trillion. And this is not just because of climate change or the environment. It's, it's mainly driven now by the fact that renewables is just a damn good business deal. It's being driven by a shift in the global energy system as markets, financial flows, and technologies start to align to give rise to a new energy system, essentially a capitalist energy system, which may not end up in a just transition, which I'll come to in a minute. But underlying that driver is the decline in the energy return on energy invested, EROI. The, the energy return on energy invested is a metric which is becoming increasingly significant because it essentially asks, how much oil do you need to generate a barrel of oil? In the 1930s, with one barrel of oil, you could generate 100 barrels of oil. Now it's between 10 and 20. You need essentially a, 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 an oil price of around $100 in order to make uh, unconventional oil uh, exploration and extraction viable, and we're not there. We're at around 70, bobbing around that, and dropped below that yesterday. And coal uh, is declining all over the world. If you put this together with the fact that we have um, the internet moving into its third phase, Web 3.0, the, 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 the age of machines, fourth industrial revolution, call it what you want. But what it boils down to is the digitization of complexity. Algorithmic coordination of increasingly complex energy grids is an absolute precondition for the transition to what is the first time ever a decentralized and distributed renewable energy system, which is what is the distinctive materiality of the renewable energy revolution. Coming to the politics of renewable energy. Let me refer to a book uh, by Mitchell called Carbon Democracy. Mitchell argued that in all previous eras during the industrial uh, period of, of, of industrial modernity, Whenever there's been a shift in uh, basic, co basic uh, energy resources, there's been a shift in politics. And to refer to two, if you think of coal, you need coal mines. When you have coal mines, you have coal miners. To move the coal to where it needs to be, you need railways. If you have railways, you have railway workers. When you have coal miners and railway workers, you have coal unions, mine worker unions and railway worker unions. All over the world, railway worker unions and mine worker unions were the backbone of industrial unionism, which in turn was the backbone of the movement that essentially put social democratic parties into power after the Second World War. In short, Mitchell argues, cult, the basis for social democracy. Maggie Thatcher comes in late in 1979. First target is the National Union of Mine Workers and breaking of the mine workers' strike and eventually the closure of the coal mines, the opening of North Sea oil, and we see all over the world a similar set of processes underway and the rise of oil as the basis for globalization, financialization, and neoliberalism. In other words, his argument is oil was the basis of free market economics or neoliberalism, or call it what you want. So, if, if coal was the basis of social democracy, oil the basis of neoliberalism, what is renewable energy the basis of? What's the politics of renewable energy? The fact of the matter is that renewable energy infrastructures are decentralized and distributed across vast territories. And what is the implications of that? And in particular, what does that mean when you factor in not just the, the hardware and, and, and space, but also the ownership and financial flows that go with the way in which this infrastructure is configured. Is that giving rise to, potentially, a new form of decentralized, community-based, participatory, inclusionary politics, which could be the driver of a just transition? Or are we seeing a corporate-driven, corporate-delivered, renewable in infrastructures around the world in increasingly large utility-scale uh, power plants 
that will not fundamentally change the balance of economic power. So I want to address that uh, question. But before I address that question, I want to uh, look at the financial flows a little bit more carefully. And there are two issues that are not fully discussed when we think of the renewable energy revolution. The first is public and private investment, and the second is community-based investments. So I want to just point out to, the, to you this, this diagram here, which shows you the relationship between public and private, uh, public and private investments. So these are public, in, the, the top line is public in, investments, sorry, private investments, and the bottom line is, pri uh, is private investment. And what you can see is that as public investment has escalated, it has also made possible uh, private investment. In fact, Matsukato, who, who published this work, argues that without uh, public investment, not just in R&D, but in, uh, in risk reduction in the early phases of the innovation cycle, uh, private sector investment would not have increased like it has. But what's interesting is that public investments tend to, to go into higher risk technologies, and as they do, they de-risk. And as that de-risking takes place, the private sector moves in. And that, if you like, dance uh, between public and private investment becomes really important when we think strategically about what this means going forward. But what is not included in the analysis of, of, of this kind is the incredible importance of community-based investments in renewables during the early phases of the renewable energy revolution in the front-runner countries, namely Denmark and Germany. In both of these countries, cooperatives were the driving forces of the wind revolution in Denmark and the solar revolution in Germany. By the year 2000, 80% of all windmills in Denmark were owned by cooperatives, about 176,000 households involved. And Vestas, the, the, the big wind company, global wind company, uh, had a relationship with these co-ops in an open learning environment which resulted in rapid learning, which is what we need now in light of the sixth uh, report of the IPCC, which says we have 12 years. Look at Germany. By 2012, 50% of all uh, solar, of all renewables, sorry, in, in, in Germany was owned by cooperatives, about 156,000 households. What's interesting to me, and I've done a very detailed study, of uh, these cooperatives in Denmark and Germany is that they were social forms of organization that were, uh, that aligned with the materiality of these decentralized infrastructures, which gave rise to open learning environments, rapid uh, innovation, which in turn fed back into the companies, which in Germany's case licensed the Chinese to do the manufacturing eventually. So it's quite an interesting irony that the kind of anti-nuke hippies of the 70s and 80s who set up cooperatives to build renewable energy power plants generated the technologies that German companies then licensed to the last communist state to make the technologies that we now depend on for decarbonizing the global economy. It's really quite an interesting uh, quirk of history. But in both of these countries, feed-in tariffs, tax rebates, carbon tax refunds, investment support, ownership restrictions, and fast depreciation all contributed to the massive escalation of these, of these uh, uh, community-based renewable energy alternatives. There have been policy shifts in both of those countries in, in favor of corporates, uh, but there's a re-emergence of federations of, of cooperatives and what is called the re-municipalization option, led in particular by Hamburg and Berlin. So before concluding, for what this means for the South African context. We have in South Africa one of the fastest growing renewable energy sectors um, in the world, from a very low base, of course. It has huge potential for uh, triggering an industrialization process. It is coming off the back of the fact that uh, coal and nuclear is becoming increasingly expensive and our coal reserves are increasingly low quality. Um, and the, the very significant drop in renewables and our extraordinary uh, 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 solar and wind resources. So it makes complete sense. And a lot of the work the CSIR has done shows that we can go, we can take that very, very far. What is not factored in is the, uh, the, the, one of the consequences of that. I'm a member of the International Resource Panel. We study 
global resource flows. And we did a study on the sustainability of the renewable energy revolution. And we concluded that if the whole world made a transition to renewables, we would need more cement, more copper, and more steel than if we stayed on fossil fuels. Now, we don't have copper in South Africa, but we have steel and cement. And so it's this, the discussion about the other, and rare, the other kinds of resources that would be required for the global energy revolution is not factored into the potential we have uh, yeah, in this country. So, in conclusion, what matters is the directionality of the renewable energy revolution. I personally, and not in the research that my research team at Stellenbosch does, we've done a lot of work on the re renewable energy power plants in various parts of the country. We are not happy with the way this is being implemented. We think that some of the criticisms out of the unions and, 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 and other places that uh, this represents a kind of privatization move of energy has certain validity. We are missing the opportunities for public and social ownership of renewable energy in a way which is far more inclusive than what is happening now. And the examples from Germany and Denmark simply indicate that there is a history of collective, inclusive social organization around renewables that we need to take a lot more seriously in our context. Luderitz, of all places, is a good example where there's municipal ownership of the renewable energy power plant. This is about directionality. Ownership, financial flows, local accountability, lo uh, rooting these power plants in local economies. Without that way of thinking, I don't think we are going to be able to realize the potential of the renewable energy revolution in the South African context. There will be a buildup of opposition. There will be increasing concerns with the extraction of surpluses and profits into other countries. And uh, that is going to undermine the, 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 the serious potential, especially in light of the concerns about uh, jobs, which we're also doing uh, research into that may be lost in, in the coal sector. So in conclusion, my overall conclusion is that if we are interested in a just transition to the transformed world referred to in the preamble of the, of the SDGs, the directionality of the renewable energy revolution is what is going to be key. And what's going to shape that directionality is whether there are going to be coalitions of forces that are going to be able to present an alternative to the corporate-driven model that seems to be being implemented now in various parts of the world, including in South Africa. Thank you. Mm -hmm.